Hey guys, my name is Ronald Salimto. I'm a registered nurse and also a family nurse practitioner. Welcome to my channel, Nurse Track 101, where nursing lectures are made easy just for you. Well, let's get started. Hello everybody, my name is, uh, this is Ronald Salimto, and welcome to Nurse Track 101. And I'm so excited today because we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is diabetes mellitus. And um, this is a very complex uh, disease or syndrome, and there's a lot that we're going to talk about today. And without further ado, let's, let's, um, let's get started. Diabetes mellitus is a syndrome of impaired carbohydrate, fats, and protein metabolism caused by either lack of insulin secretion or decreased sensitivity of target tissues to insulin. I'm going to simplify it to you and I'm going to talk to you how, how insulin works and how what does insulin do in our body. As we eat, for example, rice, bread, or um, any, any, any kind of food, that as we eat, the body absorbs, um, the body breaks down the food into, into glucose, all these are, are absorbed in our, in our, primarily in our small intestine. And as a result, after we, after we eat, there's going to be high concentration of, of glucose in our, in our system. The blood, the blood glucose, the glucose in our blood system cannot just enter our cells, for example, mu for example muscle cells. It has, it, uh, the glucose needs some help in order to, to go into the cells, to go through the cell membrane. And the help only comes from insulin. And this is what the insulin does. If you see this one right here, um, this one illustration right here, the first one, as you see, the insulin works as a key to a, uh, to a lock on the cell. Once and and this you see as the key the the key right here the this one only can only be this only insulin that fits in this in this in this lock right here so this is the, it's called the insulin receptor and this is the glucose channel one the insulin one the insulin fits into this lock right here the glucose channel will open and as a result the glucose or blood sugar can enter the cells and that's what primarily insulin uh, what the insulin what insulin does in our in our in our cells in our body uh, there's a lot more functions of insulin that I'm going to go over but this is this is how insulin works and to help facilitate the uptake or the usage of sugar in our cells so without insulin there will be um, there's going to be high concentration of sugar in our bloodstream, and there's there's no way for us to to use the sugar. Yeah, this is just a little bit a, an overview of um, of insulin. Insulin is produced by a uh, by the pancreas by by one of the cells in pancreas. As you know, the pancreas this is the pancreas is located right here just below the stomach and the pancreas itself is an endocrine gland and also it's an exocrine gland which means it also cre um, secretes some some uh, gastric juices that is needed for um, digestion and absorption of, the, of, of food and the endocrine function of the pancreas is, is this one is the production of insulin one of them is the production of insulin so the beta cells of the pancreas is responsible for the production of insulin. And the, the insulin will be increased, it will, will be secreted by the pancreas only in response to a rise in blood sugar. So after you eat, there's going to be a rise in blood sugar in your blood. The body in turn will, will sense that. And when you have increase in blood sugar, then uh, the pancreas is going to increase the production of insulin. 
Yeah, this is some of the roles of insulin besides the first one. The first one will be the, the stimulate glucose uptake by cells. That means um, this is this to facilitate the usage of glucose or blood sugar in your in your cells, whether it's muscle cells, uh, liver cells. Also, with the with the insulin, as you see, the insulin. For example, when you have, because there's so much blood sugar in your bloodstream, for example, there's so much blood sugar. This is, let's say this is sugar. There's so much blood sugar in your bloodstream. Some of them will go into the cells. So some of them also will go uh, into storage. And one of the storage is, will be, storage of, uh, of, of blood, uh, blood glucose will go into the liver. The liver will transform glucose into its, its storage form, which is glycogen. This is what happens. So the glycogen is, is a storage glucose. Storage glucose. Once the glycogen is at its limit, about 6 to 7%. Once it is at its limit, the liver will turn the glucose into fatty acid. So the liver will turn the glucose into fatty acid. This is glycogen, and this is fatty acid. So the extra sugar, the extra blood, uh, blood sugar blood, or glucose will be converted, will be converted by the liver, into fatty acids and um, fatty acids with glycerol will form um, its fats or triglycerides and this one will be stored in your uh, fat tissue so if if you if you eat a lot of carbs still the excess carbs will become fat it's important not to eat not to overeat because the extra even if you eat extra carbs it will become fat and that's what happens. And also, insulin is responsible for protein metabolism. Uh, the metabolism of protein, for example, um, this is not completely understood by science, but the amino acids, this is the um, building blocks of protein. The amino acids will, um, the insulin will help the amino acids go into the cells as well. So it will, it will, the insulin helps with the protein formation. And also, insulins will prevent gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, which means it's the production or the, um, the creation of glucose or production of glucose. So, as you see, once we have, for example, if we eat... Um, okay, one more thing. For the storage part, as... Um, if, if we have, when we have a uh, high blood sugar in, in our bloodstream, also the insulin will store uh, glucose in the form of glycogen as well in the muscle. So this is in the, there's the liver and also in the muscle. And as you can see, once you have all this, I mean, so if you, if you have high concentration of sugar or blood glucose in your in your bloodstream, then this is all that's going to happen. In the opposite, if you have in between meals, for example, if the body senses that there's no uh, there's a low in blood sugar, then the opposite is going to happen. Such as um, instead of preventing gluconeogenesis, production of glucose, gluconeogenesis is going to happen. So there's going to be a production of glucose. And the liver cell is going to convert glycogen back to glucose. The muscles is going to use the glycogen to, to, to help create glucose. And that's what happens uh, when the body is in need of, of glucose. There are two types of diabetes mellitus. The first one is the type 1. Type 1 diabetes mellitus. This is also called insulin dependent I'm going to put I'm going to abbreviate this as a DM insulin dependent 
diabetes mellitus. Why insulin dependent? Because type 1, there's a lack of insulin secretion. Lack of insulin secretion. So as you know, as um, as you know from the uh, illustration from the slide before, that uh, one the one of the responsibilities of pancreas is to produce insulin. Unfortunately, um, the pancreas cannot produce insulin or a decreased production of insulin, and this is caused by the destruction of of the beta cells. As you as you remember the previous slide. The beta cells is responsible for the production of insulin. There's a destruction of beta cells caused by autoimmunity or sometimes virus. And this is also called juvenile onset. Juvenile onset diabetes mellitus. Why? Because uh, they found this in, in children. Children, um, usually the average is age 14. Even adulthood, adults can get this one. So there's really no limit on age, but usually it happens with people when they're young. So this is called juvenile onset diabetes mellitus. The second type, I'm gonna use different color for this. The second type is called type two diabetes mellitus. So in this case, this is called non-insulin, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. It's not, it's not really, well, this, this name is not really, um, does not tell you everything about the type 2 because later on, type 2 can become insulin dependent. So non-insulin dependent, usually it's non-insulin dependent. It will start as a non-insulin dependent. And this is because of the decreased sensitivity, decreased sensitivity of cells, for example, muscle cells to insulin. And this is also called insulin resistance because, because um, there is insulin. There is enough insulin in this type 2 diabetes mellitus. There's enough insulin. But unfortunately, there's a, there's a resistance for the cells, like muscle cells, for example, to use glucose. Because um, one, of, one of the theories is that there's a fewer receptors. There's a fewer insulin receptors. Um, so the insulin cannot, cannot do its work. This is a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. And usually people who, have, who are in advanced age, like um, in, in their fifth, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, this, is, this is, usually doesn't happen in, in, um, in, in children, but sometimes it can happen in children as, as the epidemic of obesity is increasing in this country, as you can see, um, it, it can happen in children. There's more actually, more and more happen in children. So this is the two kinds of diabetes mellitus. Type one, because of lack of insulin secretion, so you need insulin for this one, definitely. Right away, type one patients will be given insulin. And type two, uh, this is a non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And then this is because of insulin resistance. The third type of diabetes, which is called gestational diabetes. And this usually happens during pregnancy. And um, they check it by using, usually using oral glucose tolerance tests or even hemoglobin A1C. People with gestational diabetes, it's very important to treat them correctly and uh, they, because they have higher chance of becoming type 2 diabetes in the future. Um, in the future. And usually this one is done, the test is done at the OBGYN, um, OBGYN office. The treatment for this, it depends on the, on the patients and on the individual and the severity of the, of the diabetes. So how do you diagnose diabetes mellitus? The first one is fasting plasma glucose. This is fasting plasma, just mean like blood, fasting blood glucose. Glucose means sugar, so fasting 
plasma glucose of more than 126 milligram per deciliter. So if you are, if you're fasting for eight hours, if you don't eat for eight hours, for example, like since 12 o'clock, 12 a.m. and the next day at 8 p.m., I mean 12 a.m. to 8, uh, 8 p.m., 8, 8 a.m., I'm sorry, and you go to your doctor's office and you're, they check your sugar and it's like, wow, uh, 140 or 150. Or 160 oh there's gonna be more most likely you have diabetes you have some kind of diabetes okay so that's the first one the second one is plasma glucose or blood sugar this is blood sugar blood sugar of more than 200 of more than 200 when you check it randomly, so whether you eat or not, and somehow you go to your doctor's office, or you can just buy one of those machines to check your blood sugar, or, um, and somehow it's more than 200, most likely you have some kind of diabetes mellitus. Okay? And the third one is blood sugar or plasma glucose of more than 200, more than 200 with 75 gram of glucose intake so this is what happens in um like if you go to a doctor's office and and they give you ogtt so oral glucose tolerance tests so basically they challenge you with drinking this um highly concentration of sugar um liquid and then they give you this one and then they will check your blood sugar and if it's more than um over 200 then they will check probably within an hour or two hours and three hours and they will check it if it's more than 200 uh, most likely you have some kind of diabetes uh, but usually what i do is um, we do this test is it's part of the physical exam and it's called glycated hemoglobin and it's called h hemoglobin a1c if this one is if it's more than 6.5 percent you are diagnosed as having diabetes mellitus. So more than 6.5% is having diabetes mellitus. Between 5.7 to 6.5%, you are considered pre-diabetes. And less than 5.7, of course, is normal. So this is how you diagnose diabetes mellitus. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope you enjoy this video. Uh, I also do hope that uh, this lecture, this video will help you in your studies to pursue a career in nursing. If you guys have a request about any other topics in nursing, leave a comment below. And it will, if you guys share or uh, like this video or subscribe to my channel, it will help me tremendously to create more of these videos. Well, I'll see you guys till next time. Bye.